The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com, where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? And uh, starting the show off tonight... A little differently there. That was signed from the International Vortex League with the string. And we're t here with Andy Colvin. Are you there? I'm here. All right. And that is uh, one of your bands, is it not? It is. That's my uh, all-time number one band. <laughs> and how old is that song? Oh, boy. Five years, uh, eight years, uh, something. Uh, okay, so not real old. You know, I'm trying to think. <laughs> yeah, about five years. It was uh, the guy that put it together was just over here visiting. He, uh, we're working on a movie. Uh, that's DJ Novocaine 132 is his name. Uh, Seattle hip hop producer. Hmm. And uh, he, uh, we're uh, working on a uh, movie of WTO. The <clears throat> we were at the WTO protests and. And uh, Novocaine was my more or less my star of the movie. He uh, just had an interesting. Uh, he really took charge at the WTO and and went around and we and interviewed people about their uh, beliefs and so forth. And it, it turned out to be a really good, great uh, movie that sort of made a, a splash on the hip hop scene. Hmm. And we're just uh, trying to uh, get it together for something more of a main, more of a mainstream type. Uh, release. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> you, you've done a bunch of documentaries, haven't you? I've worked on several, yeah. Um, and I'm just uh, working on different things. One of the, uh, getting those uh, things into print or, I mean, uh, digitally downloadable is one thing hmm. that I'm working on is I've got this backlog of, huge backlog of photos and films little documentaries and things I've done, uh, albums. I've got at least 20 more albums wow. that uh, came out at various times that we're remastering. So that was what I did pretty much um, all through 2012. We put out nine albums. Uh, they're real, I think they're all... Not, most of them are new. Like, uh, there was a couple of older ones, though. That we, so we're starting to work back through the catalog, going back in time. Now, we, are these all International Vortex League? Uh, interdimensional. I'm sorry, Vortex. that's right. Uh, yeah, we go back to the 70s, uh, where we had a show. Uh, we knew a DJ at uh, WKAZ, uh, and uh, we got a, we had a little uh, funky show that we did like a really bad talk show and uh, that's how we got started and we eventually started doing music uh, for ads and we had fake ads and things uh, huh. it was a really funny show if you go to the uh, CD Baby site for, for our band there's a description of, of those uh, developments some of which are pretty interesting and tie in in a way to the, to the Mothman story Yes, and uh, you grew up in uh, Mothman country, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Uh, my mother was from West Virginia, and uh, my dad was from New York, uh, hmm. up there near Glens Falls. And uh, so I was sort of an unusual kid, I suppose, because I, cause I, we often we would go to New York a lot in the summers and things and yet so you're kind of growing up in this you know in the mountains with a certain type of people and your mom's people are a certain way I and mean, your dad's people are from new york and they're completely different <laughs> like uh, you know one of my new york uh, aunt, uh, uncles was a big uh, gambler uh, down at, at atlantic at atlantic city and 
great guy. Uh, but he, you know, he just had the aura of a mobster. And the in- interesting thing about him was that he he actually won at uh, craps, big money too, uh, because he was psychic. Really? Yes, he claimed that that was his secret. Huh. This is after he got old and gave you know gave it, given it up that he revealed his secret. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. There's a lot of there's a lot of psychics in my family, which may I don't know have something to do with whether or not you encounter unusual entities. Yeah, yeah, because you can see into different uh, realms. Yeah, there's times when things happen like that for me, and uh, synchronous things too. But I'm not I'm not like <clears throat> I'm not the kind of person that's. Uh, always interacting with any I just I'm really kind of the opposite kind of person I'm not I've never wanted to see anything unusual Hmm. really I'm more of a fraidy cat probably (laughs) than anything else and so it's never been something that I wanted to really investigate but when the uh, Twin Towers came down you know I knew that at that point that there was actually something to it because that had been predicted by one of the kids I, I had known Really? And that was back when you were a kid? Yeah. yeah. He, he said he got the message from Mothman. Huh. And, and uh, yeah, I remembered that. And then I realized, hey, there's something to this. So, <clears throat> and I was already, already familiar with Keel. And so I just embarked on doing a video series, which grew to about 33 hours. And then we took that video series and transcribed it for the series of books that I put out. And which books and, are those? Uh, Mothman's Photographer 1, 2, and 3, and Mothman Speaks, Mothman Shrieks, and Mothman Squeaks, which is coming out any day now, pretty much. Uh, mm. It gets it covers the whole 10-year period from uh, 2001, <clears throat> 9-1-1 to basically last year all the correspondence I had all the people I interviewed and it's sort of a time capsule but it's just going to sit there for people that want to check it out it's it's a compendium of different pieces of information um, interviews on the radio um, even some of the radio interviews I've done with other people and video interviews writings of John Keel and people like that Gray Barker uh, other people even uh, now, just, how, how well did you know John Keel? Whatever felt I felt like went in how, how well did you know John Keel? Sorry you cut out cut out of me there But I heard you say that uh, How well did I know Keel? Yes I didn't know him that well I just met him in 2003 But uh, he knew that I was Serious about <clears throat> my Mothman experiences and and that I was serious about trying to do something, uh, at least with regards to the video series at that time. Mm-hmm. And he was very supportive for about three years, and then he pretty much dropped communication with everybody at that point. Is that when he got sick? I don't know exactly, I suppose. Yeah, he started feeling bad. and uh, But by that that was I had already started the books at that point so he had <clears throat> um, given me access to some stuff and gave me you know uh, support to to actually write some books on the, on what I knew and so that's what I did hmm. okay, and you, you've just released a couple of books of his collected writings of different uh, um talks he's given and different articles he's he's written one of them is called the flying saucer to the center of your mind and where does that title come from oh it's just something i thought of oh okay (laughs) i didn't know if it was a quote from him somewhere along the line or not oh well let me think let me think uh there must have been a genesis but i can't remember what it was i know i should have that on the tip of my tongue but it's a, it's a great title. It really is. I think I may have got, I, you know, I was thinking about a book called Not, uh, Flying Saucers to Hell. Mm. 
I took a flying saucer to hell or something. Like There's a book like that, and I thought, well, I guess what I, you know, for me, it makes sense because rather than <clears throat> They don't necessarily take you to hell if you become involved in the UFO abduction thing, but they're going to the center of your mind. They are, uh, you're being programmed somehow by either by the phenomenon that's out there, be it natural or whatever, or maybe synthetic, but uh, you're being programmed. And that was John Keel's basic message, I think, that this programming is happening. Right. What is it all about? I think Jacques Vallée was on that, that same level, too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, what, what fascinates are, are you fascinated in Keel because uh, of the New York connection? He grew up around yeah, there. Yeah, he, he grew up he, somewhere up here, and then just just kind of like what walked to New York City one day and got a got a job. Um, yeah, I don't know if he walked, but I, I, I think in uh, I think it was in Jado. He talks about how he just kind of packed up his stuff and walked off one day. Huh. Well, I I, I assume he. May have hitched a ride or something, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that's prob that probably is true. And uh, he just kind of did what he wanted to do. Yeah, he was a he was a great traveler. I, I had actually discovered Keel because of Fate magazine and the articles he did in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then slowly picked up all his different books as I went along. Jado was one of the last ones I picked up because it was uh, so hard to get a hold of that, or it didn't cost a fortune. And uh, that's was, a good book. Yeah, it was a great book. I mean, it's not so much covering the UFO phenomenon stuff like all his other ones, but it really is a very interesting, intriguing book. Um, what uh, you know, one of the things we've discussed here on the show before, because people have mentioned, it, is that Keel has been accused occasionally of making some of his stuff up or not reporting exactly what happened. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I think if uh, you, you, I don't know that you see that in any, any of the books. Um, if and if you see it in the articles, it was probably. Well, I take that back. He said that the <laughs> editor of Jadu made up some stuff, hmm. but it, but it wasn't Keel doing it. It was it was an editor wanting to exaggerate something, or make what Keel had said was a possibility into more of a firm reality. Ah, okay. So that's really an important thing, and I think Keel was probably affected by that more than some of the other writers in the field because his stuff was being edited at that level where, you know, these are well-read magazines that, and that you had to do it on deadline and there were going to be bureaucracy issues, you know, screwy editors, who knows. But, yeah, uh, he blamed most of that stuff on, if not all of it, on, on his editors. Hmm. And, of course, he's most well-known, of course, for the Mothman prophecies. And he did have something to do with the movie, too, right? He was like a consultant? Yes. I, yeah, I don't know to what extent, but he got paid for the rights. Mm. That was, And I don't know if he was on the set a lot or what. I, I mean, saw the making of the Mothman prophecies. I don't remember him. Uh, he, they may have interviewed him. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, they, they kind of took the UFO component out of the movie when they made it as well. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they took the, I guess, you kind of cut out there. I don't know. It must be, who knows. Uh, I live near these huge towers, so sometimes I don't know if that does, affects things. But, um, <clears throat> they, uh, yeah, they, they did a lot of things in that movie. <laughs> I liked it overall. I mean, I thought it had the right feel to it. It just didn't really cover the events as they happened. Right. But the weird thing is, is that there were a couple of scenes that uh, seemed to me that came from my dreams. Really? It, yeah. Like they put something on the film that I dreamed about or talked about. Um, so huh. there, uh, it's a spooky movie. Um, in that the, the director experienced some of the phenomenon after he had made the movie. Oh, really? That echoed things that were in the movie. Huh. In the tragic sort of fashion. Like what? Well, he lost his wife to uh, some brain um, 
something I don't know I can't remember uh, what it was hmm. something that's similar that was similar to the movie wow and at that time there was a lot of irresponsible uh, talk about a, a death a death a list uh, of people who had gotten worked on Mothman projects that had died and and it was uh, a, just one of many <laughs> unfortunate memes that have been cast about to to give people the wrong idea about what was going on. Well, can can you talk a little bit about what was going on for people who aren't familiar with it? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is just the depictions, the, the very simple stuff, the depictions of Mothman that you see that get propagated the most are the most... Uh, while they do jive with Keel in some places, like with the red eyes, mm -hmm. there's also a whole body of, of sightings that don't have red eyes. And uh, what happened, I think, there is that, again, the editors wanted to highlight the red eyes because that was more dramatic. Right. But what, what's even creepier to me is when its eyes aren't red. Why? Well, because you're having, you're having a more subtle form of communication um, it's not it's approaching you more you know with the red eyes it's like you're being warned off so you're obviously going to walk away mm, but when okay. but when it's not it's like it actually walked up it walked toward me and its eyes weren't red and, and when you saw it what did it look like it looked like a silhouette a black hole silhouette of a person whose joints bent, were double jointed huh. and maybe had wings or something back there tucked uh, but it seemed to have the personality of the kid that had predicted 911 I, I really really felt like it was somehow connected to him like maybe it, it had soaked up some of his characteristics or something I, maybe it's a you know that's one of the theories is that it's a <clears throat> it's it's kind of like the thing that Schwarzenegger was fighting in the jungle, except it would be more organic and it would be learning from you hmm. and taking on your characteristics. It's a shapeshifter. And, and what do you think the UFO connection there is? Oh, well, there's the natural side of it and the synthetic side of it. And the natural lights are sort of exist in the same realm as these... Uh, silhouette creatures or mothmen uh, uh, you mean like like earth light type of phenomena I kind of I lost you there say that again like earth light type of phenomena phenomena I heard you say phenomena <laughs> yeah I just got a whole bunch of static for some reason uh, like earth lights earth lights yes Yes, there's, uh, yes, uh, it could be that. It could be that that fuels the, the, the forming of the entity somehow or becomes the entity or, mm. uh, but they could also be projected by human minds perhaps. Kind of like a, a, like a tulpa, a thought form? Right. Yeah. Hmm. And we had some genius kids in the area at the time and I've heard that through what my Buddhist, through my Buddhist contacts, uh, that uh, some of the monks from Tibet were reincarnating in the Ohio Valley to fight the the Chinese from America, and they also these lamas also claim to be able to turn into balls of light and also into gurus, which are birdmen. So, and and that's one of the things that the Mothman gets compared to. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Um, this, you know, I mean, if you can say the, I don't know. I guess it's, I guess they are two different things. You know, an earth light versus a mental light. Mm. So they're complete. They're yeah, but um, and I don't know. You know, I didn't practice that meditation, so I don't know exactly how they're doing. Yeah, and you you were a Buddhist uh, priest, did you say? Yeah, for about a year. Hmm. Yeah. And then that stuff, and you were saying that uh, 
one of the things you've taken to doing is uh, analyzing like patterns and symbols and stuff, and that's something that is part of Buddhism, but you didn't do while you were a priest so much. Yeah, I had a couple of really shocking experiences with precognition uh, when I was going through my initiation hmm. that, that really relieved me. It almost relieved me of any feeling that I had to do any of these rote uh, visualizations or anything. I just felt like I was tapped into it enough that, you know, because a lot of people's religious practices are designed to get them in touch with something. Right. And I just feel like I'm already in touch with it, and I don't really have to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't really get along in the Buddhist group, was I didn't feel like I needed to do any, um, the same thing they were doing. Right, right. Uh, unless it was, you know, for just for certain things, just for... Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, there were times I just wanted to do something else because I, it was right for me. And I think people that are joiners has always have a hard time with that. If you can just say, you know, this, I just don't want to do this thing here. <laughs> and I'm going, and I'm not going to be part of the group for that time period. Um, you know, I could do a whole series of books on, American uh, social interaction. I'm very interested in it, and I've read a lot of uh, the history of psycho psychoanalysis, psychotherapy. And I find it very fascinating, mm. oh. and I sometimes get tied up in watching that stuff when I should be doing something more uh, more exciting, or I don't know. Uh, You can only do so much of that stuff. I, I just go through periods. I go through periods where I study intently, study some subject, and for a while, uh, you know, for a while it was Wilhelm Reich and all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, all the all the different uh, Steiner, Anthroposophy, Theosophy. Um, <clears throat> then you start to see a sort of a global map of how things interact and where things came from, trends, uh, memes. Uh, practices and uh, I don't know uh, how I would have organized it I, I was it was kind of nice to have something like this Mothman experience to sort of organize my thoughts and so uh, you saw the Mothman was that the only thing that happened is that in that one interaction uh, there was another sighting earlier um, during the initial wave where I saw it flying, again, a silhouette. Um, and was this while, while the main sightings were going on, or was this, like, before or after? Uh, the first, it was right during the first sightings. Okay. And then five years later, I saw it again, after this kid had seen it there, and three, two other kids had seen it there, and a uh, lady that lived there saw the, the, the balls of light, uh, things that we could it might associate with a Garuda uh, I talked to a, a guy who still lives there last uh, year and he says there's there's still stuff going on really yep huh, I thought all the, the stuff had quieted down after the bridge collapsed well that's what they say but that's just not true huh. <laughs> that's just one of many things that they say about the story that aren't true yeah, what, what else I mean, we've got the description is wrong. The description mm -hmm. is misleading, uh, especially the part where Mothman doesn't have a head. I don't think that, uh, I think very few of them are headless, if any. And probably because when a bird looks at you straight on at night, you wouldn't be able to see its neck. Right. Anyway. <clears throat> so if it had, you know, and, and we do have descriptions of it having a long neck it's seen in broad daylight flying so by several witnesses at once so i'm going to go with the ones you know where there's more witnesses right right and what about the men in black um who were seen around the same time intimidating witnesses and such oh uh, well uh, they're they're a bit of a mystery too We've got several categories of those guys yeah 
And it, seem, it seems like some of them may be a part of the same phenomenon. Some of them might be government involved. Yes. And some of them could be, again, Buddhist priests. Hmm. Or the Chinese government looking for Buddhist priests. Huh. Uh, because this is a real thing. Uh, they, the Chinese government goes after reincarnations of lamas. Really? Wherever they are, yes. How do you even uh, track something like that? It's in the newspaper. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. All right. I, I have, yeah, I, I have uh, I found articles about it, many, in fact, and uh, it's a well-known thing in the Buddhist community. So uh, I like talking about the Buddhist stuff because I think it's one of the more uh, theories that doesn't get talked about as much. So, yeah, I haven't heard about it. But it could explain the whole shebang. You, you think the whole thing can be explained that way? Uh, well, any, any, uh, yeah. It, well, anything in West Virginia, maybe. I don't know about in New Jersey, but there seems to be a connection with, with New York and New Jersey. The MIB there seem to be the same one. So we're in West Virginia. These are going to be humans, and they impersonated John Keel and Jim Bar uh, Mosley and Gray Barker. Right. <clears throat> they visited the street where I saw the creature and my all the other kids did. They were there, the same guys. Um, did, did you ever have any interactions with them? Uh, the only, I, not, it exists in a weird dream state. Um, so I can't really say that I've met them in daylight. Uh, real uh, Harriet, one of my key witnesses, uh, had you know daytime interaction with him. Um, so, <clears throat> there's a strange incident I write about, and that where our family may have been uh, uh, interrogated while under either hypnosis or some sort of gas hmm. that I remember happening. Like so, it seems like it was a dream, right? But my sister later, I found out she had the same dream, and she freaked out when I told her that I thought it might have been a real, real thing. If if both of us remember it, right? Who were these two guys that were grilling us? And one thing about kids is that they're harder to hypnotize, and I think that I somehow remembered it. Hmm. So, wow. Um, yeah, I think I did meet him, but just not in a normal state of mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, so you've got those guys that I think are working for somebody, some government or group, and I think that there are probably Buddhist monks are going around looking for reincarnations and probably bad. Oriental MIB looking for those guys. Yeah, Kiel had always mentioned and, that they had sort of an Oriental look to them a lot of times. Yes. Some of them could be Scandinavians working for the Soviets, though. I'd assume so you had some Soviet spies, some ex Nazi spies, some British spies, French. So it's hard to say who was which spy. Do you think and, any of them I, fall into the paranormal category? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, it depends on what you call paranormal. Um, if you have one or more people that see the same man in black, it sounds a little more likely that they saw something real. Mm. Um, but maybe the same force, whatever it was that makes one person see it, can make three people see it. Maybe it's not any more real than a single person's hallucination or whatever it is that happens when people travel to other planets or get abducted. When there's, you know, because some of these are real where people are being visited by a real person and some of them are possibly hallucinatory. Right. And some of them, the only other category, the third category is interdimensional. Uh, but, you know, the interdimensional one could, could enter into number two. It could be in a certain state that allows them to see a quote interdimensional person right and it seems totally real the only thing that would flesh it out and make 
us know that it was really real was if many people met the person that met in black over time. And you could actually, at that point, you start to think it's maybe a human being, though. So hmm. it's like a catch 22. The more evidence there is for the existence of a, of a particular MIB, the more they seem to just be a real person. And that's hap that has happened. Has anyone, ever, has anyone ever actually caught one of these MIBs? Supposedly that they have. Really? And one, one was arrested, one was uh, shot, uh, apparently, where, by the police. Where was this? Uh, New York. Hmm. These are tales you hear, you know, but, I mean, if it was a spy operation, you wouldn't hear much about it, though. It would get buried. True. And I would think that in the city like that, most of them would be, you know, spy ops. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, the, I guess there's interdimensional creatures creatures on Manhattan, but it's just a little harder for me to imagine. <laughs> All right. Well, we got to take a quick break, and we're going to hear another one of your songs from the Interdimensional Vortex League. Um, we're going with, I believe, Automobile. And uh, anything you want to say, say about this? Well, that's our... <clears throat> That was, I guess, our first big hit. It got us into the Oscar parties uh, one year, 91 or something, maybe, uh, 92, I can't remember. But uh, they played us uh, on the air, on the uh, radio the night of the Oscars one year, and we got to go and have some fun down there. And <clears throat> that was our big moment. <laughs> but we've been together a long time. How many? 30, 30 years? 40? No. Oh, God. I better stop talking. <laughs> it's not 40. No, it's 30. And, uh, yeah, this is a good song. It's about UFO abduction, sort of, pretty okay. much. All right, so we'll be back with Andy in about uh, four minutes. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. And that was the Interdimensional Vortex League. And uh, our guest tonight, Andrew Colvin, is a part of that band. And what, what do you do in the band, anyway? Uh, well, uh, I'm not that... I'm not like a... Uh, I'm not a music virtuoso, but uh, uh, I do a little bit of everything. I was a drummer for a while in the band and uh, keyboard for a while, do a lot of the singing. Hmm. Uh, nowadays, we do a lot of cut and paste stuff that's, uh, you know, synthetic, I guess, uh, synthetically derived. Uh, sometimes uh, we have long pieces that are that don't have vocals, uh, instrumentals. So we have uh, three albums on the Mothman uh, theme. Mm. that have a bunch of um, soundtrack songs, basically, for the video series that I put together. And those are some really fascinating um, different blends of music, all kinds of different genres. We've got a lot of people that have come and gone from the band. It's sort of an open <clears throat> thing. We just do... Uh, uh, do uh, It's not duets, but uh, <laughs> we uh, work with people. You know, we'll just decide, let's just do a couple of songs and see what happens and uh so we've been getting more into the electronica sort of side where we're doing some intricate uh editing things and creating sounds and and song patterns and uh we, we get pretty experimental at times too hmm. so uh but occasionally we like to do just a nice little pop kind of thing uh, a little pop abduction song <laughs> now, uh, where can people find find the music if they want to buy it uh, iTunes, Amazon, and CD Baby. Okay. And these, uh, are, these uh, came out on vinyl. Uh, some of the or later ones, uh, I guess older ones, came out on vinyl. Uh, 
and got played on college radio back when college radio was sort of college radio mm. and uh, we had uh, cassette releases uh, eight track uh, micro cassette um, <laughs> we we we've we we did one of the first iTunes um, iPhone videos, huh. uh, a cell phone recording, uh, early cell phone recording from a suitcase uh, a cell phone. We've done a lot of different crazy things, huh. uh, and gone all around the world doing these crazy things. And uh, there's a long tale about it there on CD Baby. If you look up interdimensional vortex, like you can read about some of our uh, groundbreaking inventions. <clears throat> okay. What about the video series? Where can people find that? Well, it's uh, I let it go out of print, uh, more or less. Uh, we did a run, uh, you know, uh, fairly sizable run that you, uh, nothing major, but uh, you know, contracted that out and and sold those, and now uh, I don't know. I'm just sort of getting it ready for download on the internet. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a, it's really just technical stuff. Um, the, the series was done in a certain way and recorded a certain way. And it's not, uh, it's not compatible with uh, Amazon. Mm. So we would, we would have to go back and redo a whole lot of it. Um, editing wise. And, uh, so I've just sort of been, uh, Putting that one on the back burner. Uh, there might be a way to, to make the translation and get it done easily. I'm sort of been, just been busy with these uh, uh, albums and uh, books and things. Right. Uh, the, the videos, did, you know, they 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 did they did well. I made I made a pretty good uh, uh, income from those, and they basically financed all of the books. Hmm. And now the books have uh, gone into the black, so Great. the uh, I basically have a little publishing company, and I do I publish other people's stuff too. So that's working out well, and we sort of went from a from being a record company to a to a book company. And that's Meta uh, MetaDisc. Yeah, yeah. We still do the records. And, uh, the videos are just. Uh, I'm sort of waiting to hit those with uh, all eight cylinders at one time and get a bunch of things done and, and uh, upload them. Uh, okay. Um, when your friend had the uh, premonition of 9-11, what, uh, what exactly did he see? Uh, he saw the uh, s exploding buildings and uh, ex some exploding buildings in New York. Mm. Okay. Uh, we didn't know about the towers then, so we didn't have a reference for what it was. Ah, okay. All right. Um, so uh, one of the things John Keel talks about are some of the patterns that accompany the UFO phenomena. Do you have any opinions on that? The patterns? Yeah, like the, the, the dates, the name game, uh, the fact that they take names from Greek mythology a lot of times, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's the same. You know, you still have to... You know, consider which ones were real people and which were uh, visions or whatever that is, mm -hmm. um, hallucinatory, uh, interdimensional, whatever you want to call it. Um, in that case, the percipient would be could be picking up uh, memories from their genes, from their junk DNA, and 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 they hear Greek words. And I mean, this is some people have this uh, where. They just go into a trance and speak some other language. It happens. Right. So yeah. uh, that could explain a lot of the strange connections that seem to be going on. There is some gener gen uh, genuinely synchronous synchronicity happening out there, too. Um, and then, of course, if you've got spooks, they will often just use... Uh, those kind, they'll use the same language that they've, because they know what they know what the natural phenomenon is doing. They just, uh, you know, they may go interrogate someone for seeing something, some secret project uh, craft, and then they might throw in a couple of Greek words at the end to make it seem like it was an ultra terrestrial or hmm. interdimensional 
being, and in that way, fool everyone. What, what, what do you think the percentage of uh, like experimental What's craft? That? What do you think like the uh, percentage of uh, experimental craft to actual UFOs is nowadays? Oh boy, I don't know. It's it's really hard to separate them at this point because there's so much stuff out there that you never know if you're looking at our technology or something completely anomalous. Yeah, well, I saw something two years ago that I really thought was anomalous. Really? What was uh, that? It was a shape-shifting UFO that I was with two other people that saw it. Hmm. And I took pictures of it, and you can see the difference, some of the shapes it took. Now, I still don't know uh, what that is, if that was... Could there be some kind of device that uh, does that? I don't, or I don't know. Could it be just a round device that that cha that put uh, you know projects holograms that make it look like it's changing shape? Right, right. I don't know. It, it could have been a synthetic craft, I suppose. That, that that would say a lot for our technology at that point. Yeah. Hmm. But, you know, I mean, we had remote vehicles, flying vehicles in the 40s. We did. Yes. There, I have an article from the 40s, Two Magazine, where they talk about it. Huh. Like, like drones. There's pictures of them. Well, yeah. That I There's did not know. Pictures of the control panels. Yeah, it's just all been pr pushed down, uh, suppressed, because everyone wants to promote the ET thesis because it's more saleable. Hmm. So you think some some cases were just these remote vehicles? What did they look like? Well, they could put the they could put the the device in anything. Oh, but true. These were these are airplanes. So you know, just the idea on nine one one that we didn't have planes that could fly remotely is is completely bogus. It was already fifty more than fifty years down the road. Hmm. Sixty almost. Wow. Um. One of the things that, that one of the articles you have in here uh, that Keel mentioned something that I was not aware of, and he says that uh, when there's a lot of UFO activity, there's almost always some kind of weird lightning strike, someone being hit by lightning or something like that. Any thoughts mm -hmm. there? Because that seems like a weird thing to be connected unless it's connected with the earth or the sun in some way. Yeah, it could be either. It could be natural, I suppose, you know. Uh, ball of light uh, or energy geomagnetic geomagne energy causes vision then person gets struck by lightning it could happen uh, but also it could be synthetic too because uh, I'm pretty sure they had had lasers uh, at that time in fact the the the, uh, the three guys that were invest uh, impersonating the UFO investigators Keel, Barker, Mosley those guys were shooting a laser thing at people <laughs> Really? Yes. Hmm, I don't remember that. <clears throat> yeah. I guess I maybe wasn't looking at it as if they were actual people. I was probably looking at it more as if they were interdimensional type of beings. Yeah, they had the same license plate on the car that as the car in West Virginia. So it was the same guys that were coming around our neighborhood. They were up there in New, New Jersey harassing UFO investigators. So it, that tells you s some things. And, you know, and I speculate on what those things might be. In the uh, in the books, hmm. there's well, connections. What, what what do you make of cattle mutilations? Oh boy, 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 boy. Uh, I tend I tend to think that they're being done by some big concerns, uh, energy concerns, mining concerns. What for? Uh, real estate uh, scams run people off their land. It's a good way to run people off their land. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, it's also a way to mine uh, to do uh, prospecting. How so? Uh, trace minerals leach up oh. into the plants. The animals eat the plants. If you kill them on the spot, you can be you can have a better read on what's under underground at that spot. Hmm. That's called biogeochemistry. It's a real field. And for some reason, it never gets mentioned uh, in any 
stories about it. And nor does, and with crop circles, do you ever hear that these could be done by uh, computers on satellites. They'll consider every single possibility in the, in the world except for the obvious one. Which, and how would that be done? Just with lasers from satellites. Hmm. Program in the design, it makes a design. It, it does seem like a lot of the crop circles have been proven to be fakes for the most part, like, like man-made. Yeah, that was an interesting little wrinkle they put in there. Um, to say that it was being done by people on the ground, that was a good fallback position. So then nobody had to consider satellites. Hmm. So satellites are still off the radar. I can only think of me and maybe one or two other people that have ever gone in that direction. Although they're starting to come, you know, the, the, I was the first, I'm pretty sure, just because I'm <laughs> uber skeptical sometimes. And as time has gone by now, you're hearing more crop circle people say, well, you know, maybe, you know, because these designs are all human based sort of, yeah, you know, why would aliens do, you know, pro, uh, designs designed f to meet our historical perspectives or future perspectives, like with designs of computer chips and things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it just doesn't wash. So unfortunately, I know that it hurts might hurt the tourist industry but <clears throat> so i don't i don't go around preaching on that one too much i just if somebody asked me well you didn't ask me so i guess i brought it up but <laughs> well why do, why do you think they would do why would they make a crop circle what would be the point oh uh, well, to start a new religion mm -hmm. to start a tourist industry yeah it definitely has done that Probably won't run a farmer off his land, though. Right, right. Yeah. They put up donation boxes, and they make money off of it as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's totally sold that whole region of Britain that has the earthworks as a, as a special place. I mean, they've totally made that into a huge industry. Hmm. All right. It goes along with the summer festivals they have, too. Really? It's... They, they get more music, uh, yeah, more, more, more beer being sold, uh, you name it. Yep. Um, one, one of the things Keel mentions in the book that I hadn't heard him in your book of, of writings of his, he mentions that uh, UFOs also correlate to solar activity, and I thought that was very interesting because uh, Robert Schock has a book out showing how psychic ability also correlates to solar activity, and it seems like yes. that, that would be a direct tie-in right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Puharish uh, back in the '60s was doing some research like that too. Yeah, whenever you have a, whenever the sun's uh, more active, we have less psychic things happening here. I, I thought it was the other way around. Uh, that was what I thought too, but and hmm. I could have it backwards. I could have it backwards, but I remember, I remember running across both examples. Which one was it? <laughs> I'm pretty sure um, when it's more active, because I thought it was the other way around, and then <clears throat> I think it turned out to be when it's more active, psychic ability increases. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll have to check it. I mean, but, regardless, but, there's a correlation. As, as far as it goes with the experiments done in the lab, um, when there's... Uh, when one end of the spectrum is passive... Uh, it tends to be more receptive to it's being quieter you see so it, can, it listens and it hears signals better see there's a sending and receiving so the sun may be sending more uh, I don't know when it's you know and is there a correlation between solar flares here or not right or, or are we just talking about other this uh, multitude of different waves involved so um but the basic idea is that it's like a balloon. You squeeze one end and the other end gets filled up. It's like, um, it's, a, it's a cycle. So there are periods where we have higher psychic ability because of what the sun is doing or not doing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, is, a, it, is, a, it is a correlation, yes. And, and it probably does increase scenarios where people envision 
these these experiences. Yes, absolutely. Um, he he also talks a lot about infrared. Uh, you know, <laughs> like being able to detect UFOs coming from the infrared, as well as being able to see invisible UFOs that are not there to the naked eye. Yeah, then it gets real fascinating uh, at that point because you know you're probably not into man-made vehicles yeah. anymore. Yeah, and and there there are crazy things that that go beyond that paradigm. So we're looking at truly unusual things. Although, how much of it still is in the mind of the recipient? I, I remember seeing a video that was actually <clears throat> shot from a police helicopter in Florida, where they were being followed by this basically invisible UFO. It was like a morphing type of ship. And they couldn't see it. It wasn't there, but it was showing up on their night vision cameras. Um, how much morphing was it doing? Not, well, a, I mean, not a lot. It just seemed to be twisting around a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of like the thing I saw, which it was actually doing more than that. So, uh, but yeah, it's hard to it's hard to say how could that be? How could that be man made? Yeah. It just doesn't seem like it could be. Unless our technology is way, way far more advanced than we know of. Or unless it's a hologram. Mm -hmm. That might not be so hard. I don't know. But uh, but wouldn't that also be visible? I mean, to make it infrared, it almost would have to be a solid object, wouldn't it? I don't know. Maybe they can project an infrared hologram. I don't know. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it's supposed to pick up heat sources, but maybe there's a way to mimic that. I don't know. Hmm. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. Um, the two Keel books you have released now are The Flying Saucer to the Center of Your Mind. These are selected writings of John Keel. And what, what's the other one that's published already? The Outer Limits of the Twilight Zone. Okay. And those are also selective writings? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what else do you have coming out? We have uh, The Mothman Squeaks, which is my... Uh, Sort of my finale, I suppose, of my 10-year Mothman investigation that's coming up soon. And uh, several other things. The other Keel book. Got some audio versions of my some of my previous stuff. Uh, and some of Gray Barker. We're going to be maybe releasing a couple of Gray Barker things. Uh, uh, and, and Gray Barker, for anyone who doesn't know, was also an investigator of the, the Mothman. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, I've got a couple of movies I'm working on, uh, the WTO thing and a thing about uh, the slacker generation. Hmm. Didn't you uh, already do one on the slacker generation? No. Oh, uh, okay. No. Uh, well, I've been working on it for a long time. It's oh, okay. A, it's, a, it's one of these things where you follow people for 25 years, and we are uh, just getting to 25 years. So I, wow. gave, myself, I gave myself that much time to... <laughs> To get it done, so I'm going to be pulling that together. Uh, and I've already <coughs> already pulled it together uh, in some fashion. It's a hundred hours of material. Wow! Which I'm going to probably start with a book first uh, of the stuff that <coughs> uh, using transcripts and things. The so different people I interviewed come up with a basic theory, if there is one, um, and then. Uh, edit, edit it for a, a video release. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, and you have a, a book on Sasquatch out as well, right? Yeah, Praise for the Hairy Man, The Secret Life of Bigfoot. Um, we just have the audio book of Men in Black, The Secret Terror, which is a really great book by uh, Gray Barker. Hmm. Very nice audio book. Well, very well done. Perfect. Uh, we've got the perfect guy for that. Uh, he's uh, got the right, got the right uh, tone for uh, telling these uh, uh, tales of uh, of mystery from the misty Appalachians. Huh. Interesting. Is that uh, take Sasquatch? Uh, when you get to the uh, Sasquatch book, does that uh, go in more of a paranormal sense or? Uh, flesh and blood type of thing. I heard you say something about Sasquatch and being paranormal. The uh, the Sasquatch book does that look at it in the in a more paranormal sense or a flesh and blood type of sense? The praise book. Yeah. Well, we've got everybody in there. Uh, we've got people from all sides of that issue. Oh, okay. So every, everybody gets represented, uh, but we the authors took. Uh, we believe in the inter interdimensional 
uh, approach. Again, though, you don't know how much of it's in the mind of the recipient mm -hmm. and how much is outside and how do we measure those things and, and really be able to say something definitive. It's, it's a very tough job. All right. And uh, where can people find you on the web? I like to hang out on Mothy Talk on Facebook. Okay. That's where we, we've got some really uh, crack uh, researchers there. We're, we're on top of, uh, we pretty much solve every uh, conspiracy out there before everybody else even knows what's, it's, that it's, uh, there's a conspiracy. It's a, I can't speak more highly of it. So uh, just go to Facebook and ask for Mothy Talk. Mm. And uh, with a Y. <clears throat> okay. And uh, I've got a blog at 14swest.com as well. To click on Washington State. Okay. All right. And uh, your your book, your publishing company, is that have a website? Uh, MetaDisc. Well, that's another story, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which would involve another hour. But uh, <laughs> yeah. We're under a protest. It's a long story. We, our site was stolen by the NSA. Really? Uh, to, to, to give you a short... Well, we, we're not sure exactly who. I guess I shouldn't say the NSA. But uh, we don't know exactly who. Yes. Yes. So I just... Go ahead. Was it hacked or... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... so, so I'm, so we're wearing the black band on our arm, and we're saying we're not even going to bother with the damn website if you're going to, they're going to do that to us. Hmm. But um, I don't see a need for uh, for it right now. But I do think it's something that we need to get to soon because we're starting to uh, get uh, we're up and uh, getting up there in, in books. So, but they are yeah. all available on Amazon, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I started I started these as a way to do the Mothman books and, and now it's sort of expanding out and so I have to uh yeah, definitely get a website here. Okay. All right. Great. Well I thank you for talking with us. Yep. And uh maybe we'll have you back at some point and uh get into some other stuff. All righty, thank you. And we're gonna end with Flying High with the Mothman from the Interdimensional Vortex League. Anything you wanna say about this one? Uh R. I. P. uh um Lou Reed, uh, it's a Lou Reed song that we uh, changed the lyrics to, and it's pretty pretty good. All right. Okay. It's a fun one. All right. Hopefully. Thanks, All right. Thanks Andrew. Bye.